Hello, everyone. This is Barbara Rosgoni. I am your host of Growing Social Now, and I'm excited you're here. I'm inviting you to subscribe so that you catch every exciting episode like the one we have today with David Meerman Scott. Welcome, David. Thank you, Barbara. So good to be here. We've been um, buddies on social media for what, 15 years, something like that? I know. It's like it's gone by so fast, hasn't it? Well, it's crazy that social media has been around for 15 years, isn't it? I mean, I think Facebook was only for students until I want to say 07. Mm -hmm. Twitter started in I think very late 06, but didn't really get any traction until 07. So yeah, it's been about 15 years. And that was the year that you wrote the new rules of marketing and PR. And when I read it, I felt like, wow, the world really needs to hear this. And I was so excited because you were talking about how we need to be publishers and stop spending so much money on ads. And I thought, oh, he really gets it. So I immediately became an evangelist. And I'm so excited to talk to you about the new edition. And I guess over 425,000 people have read the previous editions throughout the world. It's been um, translated into 29 languages. And a lot of times when people say, oh, another edition, oh, why should I read it? But I have to tell you, after reading it, I was like, everyone needs to read this update. So David, can you tell us why you think people need to read it? Thank you. I, I, pre, I appreciate that. Yeah, the, so the first edition came out in 07, but I was writing it in 05 and 06. Um, I mean, that was really early when it comes to these ideas that we're talking about here. Uh, and, um, and at that time, um, you know, Twitter didn't exist. Facebook was only for students. It was a really different world. So every couple of years, I've been updating the new, the new rules of marketing and PR. The new edition is the eighth edition, which I, is an amazing thing to me, actually, that we're in the eighth yes. edition. Um, the strategies remain the same. The basic idea of what you were attracted to and many, many, many other people were attra- attracted to in the early days was that um, we were broken from the tyranny of having to pay for advertising. And that had never really happened before. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the reason that we could break away from the tyranny of advertising is we could create our own content. Um, At that time, uh, in the early days, it was um, writing a blog post, it was creating a great website, it was an email newsletter. Uh, And many people um, hadn't really thought about those as ways to market. It was about generating interest within this within the search engines so i was um the first person to have written a popular book about all those topics and that was that was super cool but each um couple of years there's new tools that come along there's new strategies that come along there's new ways that the algorithms work that come along there's uh, you know in the recent edition TikTok is big um, social audio services like Clubhouse have become popular from some people. Um, so I'm constantly updating it. The other thing I'm doing with each edition, which is super important, is I'm looking for new examples to share because the book has always been example driven. I don't look at myself as some airy fairy kind of academic. In fact, I've never taken a marketing course in my life, I've never taken a PR course in my life. And ironically, now, the new rules of marketing and PR is used in hundreds of universities. Mm-hmm. So I think that's kind of cool as I got myself into those. And I, I do not have an MBA, but many MBA um, courses teach my books. So I get in the back door to those, those programs that I never actually did myself. And, um, and so there's new stories in the book that are stories of success. And there's always been stories, uh, but I want to have um, those examples from people who have used some of the newer tools that I've talked about in this most recent edition. Yeah, I love that because a lot of times you read books and there's theory, or maybe there is a story, but it's not very strong. And the stories that you lay out, I mean, there's a lot of different tangents. So do you want to share a couple or, or one that you really like? Um, or they're, they're, they're the same story as everybody else tells. Exactly. Yes. You know, it's like, um, it, and so true. I, if, if other people are telling a story, I won't tell that story. I'll purposely eliminate it from my writing if if it becomes the kind of story that people talk about. So um, I'm a huge fan of the idea of real-time communications. My first job was on a bond trading desk, so I learned all about real-time communications um, back in my first job. And then I worked for real-time financial service, financial information providers like Dow Jones and Reuters for 
um, more than a decade. So I really got steeped into this idea of real-time content. And that's one thing that most marketers and most PR people, most entrepreneurs don't focus on is real time. How can you create a piece of content that's going to be interesting right now? And so one of the concepts I invented is called newsjacking. Mm -hmm. And newsjacking, I define as the art and science of injecting your ideas into a breaking news story, which means when there's a news story that's breaking, that's in an area that you have an expertise you should create some real time content, whether that's a blog post, a YouTube video, um, you know, put on a webinar, um, get on social media, use appropriate hashtags and put it out there because that's when the media is interested. What most people do is they say, hey, I wanna talk about my stuff now. You know, they send a press release, they write a blog post, whatever it is, you should pay attention to me now. No one cares now. But then the same people, when there's something going on in their marketplace, don't do anything. And that's when the market cares about it. So let me give you an example. And this is a story from the new book. Um, when the pandemic hit, um, I mean, of course, it affected many, many, many different businesses. And one of the businesses, surprisingly, that it affected was um, the law business around family law. Mm -hmm. And so I got to know a lawyer in um, Ontario, Canada. Um, uh, he has uh, several different um, law offices um, outside of the Toronto area. His name is Russell Alexander. And um, Russ recognized that um, in early 2020, families were confused about what happens when, for example, one member of a divorced set of parents wants their kid child to attend in-person school, while mm -hmm. another, the other parent of that divorced couple does not want their child to attend in-person school. Or um, one um, member of the divorced um, family uh, wants their child to go to summer camp while the other one doesn't. It turns out there was no law around what it meant when one person wanted stricter COVID lockdown protocols for their child in a divorce situation, the other one didn't. So um, what Russ did was he began to write about this and speak about this and create YouTube videos around this and a podcast around this. And so over the course of, of, of several months and into a full year, he had the best content in all of Canada wow. around family law and, mm -hmm. the, and, the, and the pandemic. And mm -hmm. what it means for a family to be dealing with these issues of um, uh, uh, of of family law and COVID, and he created a COVID nineteen and family law information center. So the bottom line of doing this was, and and this is classic newsjacking. It's classic real time content. When there was a case that came up in front of a judge that was going to set precedent in terms of Canadian law. He would go there and he would write about it immediately as the case came down. Then he would be interviewed in the press. He got, um, I think, probably, I think last time I spoke with Russ a couple of months ago, he told me he had like 60 or 70 different interviews. To, uh, the Globe and Mail, the most important newspaper in Canada, wow. CB, CBC, the most important television station in Canada. And this led to a 30% increase in his business. He had to actually hire five new lawyers. And this wow. was during this was during a time when everybody else in his um, area of law was actually laying off lawyers. He had mm -hmm. to f hire five new ones. Wow. It's been transformational for his business. And so that's the idea of what these ideas in the new new rules of marketing PR can teach. And in this case, um, uh, it's a new example in the book um, around the idea of real time communications and newsjacking. Wow. And so he rose up as being the thought leader in a very, very important area. I mean, I'm sure there are so many families across Canada and probably the world that we're thinking about how do we deal with these situations? So, yeah, that's, that's and, and exact, exactly right. And what's interesting to me is any number of lawyers, there's, I don't know, I'm going to guess, maybe there are 10,000 family law lawyers in Canada. I have no idea. It's a, yeah, just a no, wild ass guess. Yeah. <laughs> any, any one of them could have done it, but 9,999 did not. Right. Russ Alexander did. 
-hmm. And he became, and last time I went to Google, I typed in something like Family Law Canada, I can't remember, COVID-19 COVID and Family Law Canada or something like that, number one on the search results. Wow. And, and hundreds of millions of hits. So yeah, this is this works. This is the way to get noticed. This is the way to generate attention. And it's all free, 100% free. Which makes it even better. And to use a really, really real-time example, I know Krispy Kreme is uh, newsjacking gas prices. And I saw that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I actually wrote, I wrote about that on my blog yesterday, and I'm, I'm not sure when people will be um, will be listening in on this as we're recording it. But um, yeah, when gas prices started to rise significantly in the middle of April of 2022, um, Krispy Kreme rather cleverly jumped in and said, hey, we're going to, on every Wednesday, we're going to peg a dozen glazed donuts at the same price as a gallon of gas that day. Um, and that's super clever, super interesting. Yes. And, um, and it, uh, they wrote a press release, they created a, a little landing page on their website, and that pretty much was it. And then the media took off with it, because the media loves stories like that. And that's classic mm -hmm. newsjacking. Um, so in this case, we've got a big consumer brand and Krispy Kreme doing it. Mm -hmm. And then we've got a small entrepreneurial law firm, I think I don't rem no, remember how many lawyers he has, I want to say a dozen or 20 something like that small law firm can also do newsjacking anyone can do it. Wow. Well, I, I hope I'm quoting you correctly, but I think in your book, you said something like there's no tool that's more essential than Twitter for newsjacking. And um, with social media in general, I'm finding there's a trend with marketing and PR people to kind of put Twitter by the wayside and rush into TikTok. So what do you think if, as far as, I know Twitter is really important, but how does TikTok play into the game and the other social media platforms? What can we learn about these from reading your book? So in my mind, um, it's not an either or. Okay. Um, there's a couple of different things to think about. Um, the first thing is who is your target market? Mm -hmm. um, who are you trying to reach? Um, and if you're trying to reach a consumer marketplace, if you're trying to reach the younger generation, if you're trying to meet, reach people who are very, very plugged into their smartphones, um, TikTok is important. If you're trying to reach senior people, if you're trying to reach the media, if you're trying to reach um, high levels of government, if you're trying to reach um, people of importance. Twitter is essential because Twitter is the tool that CEOs and executive suite um, people and nonprofit executives and um, prof university professors and members of government and um, uh, civil servants. Uh, these are the people who are active on Twitter. It is very much um, uh, a place, a, a journalist as well, absolutely. Journalists use Twitter to, to write stories every single day. So, right. um, so I don't see it as either or. I don't at all see it, there being any evidence that Twitter is going away or anything like that. And, and I think it's a false metric to look at things like the number of, um, of active users, things like that, which the media always wants to try to focus on. Um, I don't think that's an appropriate way to consider whether a particular tool is the right tool to go on. Um, I do think, though, that those, those two aspects are very important. Where are the people you're trying to reach? So, okay. for example, if you're um, trying to reach a, um, a, a B2B marketplace um, um, for a, a product or service that's used by businesses, bought by people within a company using company money, you probably want to be on LinkedIn. Um, if you're trying to reach um, um, people like journalists, you probably want to be on Twitter. If you're trying to reach uh, consumers, you want to consider how Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and others might be the appropriate place to go. But I don't see it as an either or. Well, that's a good answer because I think people should have more of an encompassing, all-encompassing viewpoint. But uh, it's it's good to know that you should really look at your audience and, and consider it what's best for you. So. The other thing I think is important is that you should not beat yourself up if you're not doing everything. Um, Thank you. <laughs> I, I think, I think, it, yeah, right. Uh, I think it's, I think it's way better to focus on mm -hmm. a couple of things than it is to try to spread yourself too thin. 
You know, I'm the guy who wrote the book. I'm not on TikTok. I'm not on, I mean, I do have a Snapchat account, but I'm not on Snapchat in any significant way. Um, I do Facebook, but not really for business. I just put out stuff now and then. Um, Instagram is not really for business either. Twitter, LinkedIn are both focused on the work that I do. Um, so I don't worry about the fact that I'm not on TikTok. That's okay. Um, my blog is very important to me. Um, that's the first, I don't know if we want to call it a social network, but I will, I'll call it a social network. That was the first social network that I, that I did. And, um, I've done, I've been blogging now, um, um, almost, you know, on a very regular basis, weekly or more than weekly for 18 years. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that's very important to me. And, and I think that a lot of people, when they're focused on social media, um, they don't consider their own social media in the form of a blog or something similar as being as important. But guess what? You own that real estate. And that's really, really important. You know, um, you can build a presence on a social network and it can go away. You know, Google Plus, um, I, I added, here's an interesting thing from the different editions of the New Rules of Marketing and PR. I added Google Plus to an edition when Google created that as a social network. I'm going to guess it might have been around the third edition, something like that. I can't remember. But then Google completely shut down Google Plus. There were 50 million users. They said, sorry, we're not going to do this anymore. And um, so the next, I think it would have been the last edition, the seventh edition, I had to write it out and say to the readers, hey, Google Plus used to exist, it doesn't anymore. Mm -hmm. But imagine you spent, um, uh, you know, one, you know, you, you did a Google Plus update every day for, for five years, and all of a sudden it's gone. Your entire presence is gone. Or imagine you're on LinkedIn or Facebook or Instagram, whatever it is, and you're focused on that's where your lead generation comes from. If they change the algorithm, your leads go to zero. That's so, right. Yeah. Um, but what you can own is your own website and you can own your own blog and you can own the things that you've got a URL and that you've created. Mm -hmm. And I think that I think as people have dug into social media, some people are forgetting that you need your own powerful home base to mm -hmm. push people to. Um, and the social networks should be a place to generate attention, but then you push people back to your home base as the place where action happens, where they express interest or buy a product or service. Yeah, that's so true. And I, I think about with Google Plus, all the communities that just dissolved. And I was working yeah. with a client and they were in the aviation industry and the community is gone it's and there gone. was no, no place to find it anywhere. It's you know? gone. Where did you, it's and, and, gone. There, and this happens all the, this happens all the time with social network. Vine was another popular one that disappeared. I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was on Vine. I probably did 20 or I don't know more than that. Probably a hundred different Vines. Yeah. Gone. There was a, it was short form yeah. video and it's gone. It does not exist anymore. So, you know, you need to be a little bit wary of putting your, all of your um, businesses um, um, efforts into um, a, a focus on a particular social network. Yeah, that's great, great advice. And I know that the, the algorithms change all the time. We don't have any control over that. So if your community doesn't have a place to gather that's around your site, that's a problem. And so on this show, I always like to talk about the future trends. And I know there's a lot of talk about web 3.0. I know in your book, you cover artificial intelligence for marketers. So if you're looking for what's up to the minute, definitely get this edition of the book because you're going to be so equipped for what's ahead. So if you could just kind of get your crystal ball out, David, or whatever you use to tell us what's coming, that'd be great. Um, yeah, so those are two things that I've got my eye on. Um, the first thing, though, is something that that started a while ago, 10 years ago, maybe, and has really become, I think, a significant issue for 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 humanity. And that is the nature of the social media algorithms. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I believe that the Facebook algorithm is the most destructive technology ever invented. I think it's terrible for humanity. I think it pits people against one another. In our country, the United States, it pits the red team against the blue team. It pits those who believe that vaccines are beneficial against those people who believe that vaccines are not beneficial. Uh, it, in the UK, it, pick, it pitted the people who were um, for or against Brexit against one another. 
Um, it breeds um, uh, conspiracy theories. The Facebook algorithm rewards anger and hate. Um, it is, I believe, incredibly destructive. And um, the other social media all have algorithms. They all um, have elements of, of this negativity attached to them as well, but I believe Facebook to be the worst one. So I think it's important for all of us to understand how those algorithms work. I don't mean at the, the, at the, at the precise nuance level, because I don't understand that myself, but in the basic idea of how they work and just understand that especially with Facebook, the algorithm is driving destruction. I, 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 I don't think January 6th would have happened without Facebook. Um, and so that's a, I, I would consider that a trend in the sense that I sure do hope that people will recognize that that's an issue. Unfortunately, most journalists and politicians have been focusing on the issue of free speech. Mm -hmm. Free speech and the algorithm are two different things. I'm a strong believer in free speech, but I, had, I am absolutely not a believer that your free speech can be free, should be and can be freely um, manipulated by algorithms. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's very, very important for people to consider. And I've written about that in the new rules of marketing and PR. The idea of Web3 is misunderstood by a lot of people. Um, the idea of Web3 really is around the idea that, um, the, that our content, our social presence can be managed on the blockchain and we can be a sense independent parties that can then um, can have more control over how our um, online presence is seen and, and heard and felt. And I do think that there is potential for Web3 going forward. But I started, I didn't, we didn't use the term Web3 at the time. I started writing about these ideas six or seven years ago. And at that time, I thought we were three or four years away. So I don't know, are we a decade away from the true benefits of Web3? Maybe it's a long, long way out. Um, you know, it's a long way out before you and I have our own presence controlled by the blockchain and we can decide outside of Facebook and Twitter and the other places where we want our social presence to be. We can decide outside of the people who sell ads that we want to sell our attention individually to particular um, sellers of um, advertising services or not. Um, that's a long way off. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, in some ways, technology just took off with COVID, you know, especially like with e-commerce, all of a sudden people were moving online so quickly. But I think the problem for me with Web3 anyway is just trying to wrap heads around what it can do. And it's still in such a developmental phase. I don't know how I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I think it's going to take a little longer than we think it will. So Yeah, I mean, there was a Web3 web social network called Mastodon that started... Um, I don't know, I, I wrote a blog post about it when I joined, it had to mm -hmm. be four or five years ago. And, and I thought, oh, that's interesting. That's a potential future is not necessarily Mastodon, but something like Mastodon. Mastodon. And it's basically um, a social network where there is no entity corporate, there is no corporation that controls it. It's just people who using, using um, uh, their own presence and I don't think that was blockchain based, but um, can can create it. And, and, you know, I don't know. It's still around, I think, but never took off. Yeah. How about that? Wow. Well, you've written a lot of books. I think is it you've been an author, a co-author of at least 10. And I've done 12. Yeah. 12. OK, wow. And one of them is marketing lessons from the Grateful Dead. So yeah, I would. it is that, indeed. <laughs> if I didn't ask you, what are some marketing lessons that we should take from the Grateful Dead? So I wrote Marketing Lessons from the Grateful Dead. It came out about a decade ago with Brian Halligan, the um, co-founder um, and uh, former CEO, now chairman of HubSpot, as well as Bill Walton, who I ran into at a festival this past weekend in California. I went to a great guy. He wrote the forward to the book. And, um, you know, the Grateful Dead were all about um, serving the fans. And um, if it was a trade-off between how do we make more money and how do we um, serve the fans, they always went down the line of how do we serve the fans. Um, and one of the, the more interesting aspects of that is 
starting in, in the 70s, the Grateful Dead allowed fans to record their concerts. Mm -hmm. um, you could bring professional level recording gear into the show. They had um, a, um, a they had power outlets for you. They had a particular place in the venue for you to be able to sit, and which had great um, sound quality. And you could make initially it was cassette tapes and copy those tapes and give them away or trade them with people. The only stipulation is they didn't want you to sell them. And this was brilliant because every other band said no. You know, the Rolling Stones or Pink Floyd or whoever said, no, you can't record our concerts. What are you, crazy? The Grateful Dead said, sure, why not? Bring in your gear. Here's the, a great place to set up your equipment. Here's a place you can plug into some power. And um, they did it because the fans wanted to do it. And so they did it for fans, but it turned out to be brilliant marketing because that's how people like me learned about the band is we were exposed to the music on these. Initially, there were cassette tapes. Um, when I started to listen, when I was um, in high school in, in the late 1970s, and people listened to it in their dorm room or in their um, car stereos. And, and that then prompted people to say, oh, wow, I like this music. I want some more. And then sooner or later, they said, I really like this music. I'm going to buy a concert ticket. And then if you're like me, I've bought 85 concert tickets wow. <laughs> because I've been, I've been to 85 shows. I, I now um, uh, not only have I written a book about them, I, I also have acquired some artifacts related to the Grateful Dead. So I've spent, I don't know, a couple hundred thousand dollars on the Grateful Dead wow. in, 40, in 40 years. Um, and I don't think I would have spent that money if I hadn't been exposed to them through the, those tapes. So um, the lesson there for all of us is make your content free. Push out, push out your content, make it available. Don't do what so many B2B companies do and, and put a gate behind your content and make people fill out a form to get your white paper or whatever. Make it totally free. I love that. And my husband was a taper. And so uh, he was in the taper section. And nice. I, I asked him about it before this interview and I had to cut him off because he had so much to tell me. So. Good for him. I mean, <laughs> you know, we, we are everywhere. The same you goes are. of Grateful Dead fans. It's super cool, super interesting. So give him my best if you would. Oh, I will. And talk about staying power. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So uh, as we wrap up here, David, is there anything else you'd like to share with us about the book or marketing and PR in general? Um, I think that um, two observations about marketing and PR in general, and I've been in, in marketing basically my whole life. Um, mm -hmm. uh, as a kid, I started um, cutting grass and I kind of marketed to the neighbors that I'm, hey, I, I'm going to cut your grass, you know, and um, and then I worked as a marketing uh, professional um, for various companies, big and small. Um, uh, most, my most recent corporate job was I was a vice president of marketing at part of Thomson Reuters. And, and now for the last 20 years, I've been doing my own thing. I think where, where I am right now is marketing success comes from a couple of things. Number one, humanity. Mm -hmm. And how can you be more human? Don't be a robot. Don't like use stock photos and, and use big, big buzzwords, but instead, you know, speak and act like a human being and, 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 and be respectful of people. The second concept is those of us who do marketing, whether we're professional marketers or whether we're entrepreneurs, and by definition, that's part of our job, this should be fun. This shouldn't be a task. This shouldn't be, oh my God, you know, I've got to do my <laughs> marketing, you know, because there's so many cool and fun and interesting ways to get the word out there. And, um, and if you make it fun, then I think um, you're going to make it more successful as well. I love that. I love that. And where can people find you online, David? So I use my middle name professionally because there are a a bazillion David Scotts on the world. There's a David Scott who walked on the moon, a David Scott who's a, an Ironman triathlon champion, a David Scott who's a member of Congress from the state of Georgia. But there's only one David Meerman Scott. That's me, M-E-E-R-M-A-N is my middle name. So if you Google me, you will find me and only me. Um, <laughs> if you wanna know um, um, more about newsjacking, which we talked about. I've got a website at newsjacking.com. There's more about the book on um, my website, davidmeermanscott.com, and on the social networks, 
I am um, mostly like uh, Twitter, Instagram, and a few others, DM Scott, D-M-S-C-O-T-T. -T. Great. So I always end every episode by asking my guests, what is your word of the day? My word of the day? Well, I guess I just said it, fun. All right. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, there's your call to action, folks. Go out there and have fun. And if you want to have even more fun, buy David's book, the eighth edition of the new rules of marketing and PR. It's been my pleasure to be with you all here today. I invite you to subscribe so that you don't miss any more exciting episodes and you're with us all along the way. And thanks again, David. Thank you so much, Barbara. It's great to speak with you. Let's go have fun, everyone.